company in the UK in support of your fantastic new album, Too True. And the album was written in your apartment in New York. You moved to New York after a tough and turbulent personal period. You know, you've stated you felt open to everything again. How refreshing were the aspects of self-awareness and acceptance during the writing period? Um, it was it was a nice surprise after having taken uh, so much time off from uh, writing with intention to realize that, oh, okay, I'm writing about all sorts of things again, not just one or two things that had dominated um, not just the music I was making, but my just life and general mood um, for a while. So it was, it was great, and it was it was cool because over the course of maybe six months, I had this anticipation that I was going to sit down and write like a body of work all at once, um, which is not really how I've worked in the past. I've always kind of written as I've had time, and then stopped at some point gone over things, collected them, figured out how it worked as a, you know, cohesive mm -hmm. album. Um, but this, I just had this itching, uh, ever-pressing <laughs> feeling that I was supposed to sit down and kind of do something in a, in a different way from how I'd, how I'd done it before. The album, uh, it's critically and commercially acclaimed, uh, I feel it's taken Dong Dong Girls to brilliant new heights and you're responsible for such great material that you crafted. And you know, what was it like for you to see your ideas coming into reality and not, no longer just being ideas and your material coming into reality? How, how gratifying was that for you? Oh, it's great. I mean, I, uh, I'm such an introverted musician in terms of how I write and how I demo and then how I record, you know, I keep it pretty much on lockdown. Um, I do go into the studio with my producers, but I have a pretty well-established idea of what I want. Um, and so it's more like, okay, this is an impression of, of I know where this is going to go. Let's see like how close we can get to it or, you know, how, how much farther we can take it, you know, in, a, in an appropriate way. So it's, it's always really exciting. Um, to see it come together, you know, outside of my head. And, and then there's this whole second component where it's really exciting to then take it to the band and rehearse it and then take it on tour, you know, because Dum Dum Girls kind of exists in, in a, you know, two, two senses, you know, it's, it's a tool for me to write and record and create. And then it's, this other thing that takes it out and plays it, you know, for the world, and, and that's the uh, that's the more um, social component, and that's where I get to remember why it's great to play with other people because I do keep it so <laughs> so independent you know, for a good chunk of it. It's always refreshing to be like, oh yeah, that there's there's no way that I could capture how this feels to play with other people on stage other than by doing it like this. You know, the collaboration is pretty vital, I think, at least for for the fulfillment that I'm looking for. Okay, and you know, in terms of the album's output, how critical was the third textural guitar that you added to almost every song in giving the album a bigger and darker sound? Um, I mean, that was, that was like one of the few, um, tools that I decided to use sort of, you know, prior to really recording anything. Um, again, with this record, I sat down and I wrote it really quickly. So instead of, you know, for example, writing on my acoustic guitar and then, you know, later demoing it electrically and figuring out parts, I wrote it you know, with my electric guitar, with the ghosts of the drum sample styles I was interested in using, um, but I'm not a, a capable a, a capable guitar player in, in that style at all. So for me, that was just an idea that I was thinking um, would be a good new thing to incorporate. I'm, I'm always trying to do something new, you know, sonically, 
subtle or or more drastic with each record and so that was just something that I had been um, thinking about could add a lot particularly because a lot of the songs were mid-tempo um, that was in relation to the way because of the way you were playing your rhythm guitar wow you really did your homework <laughs> um, yes I uh, historically have you know I'm just a really pretty mediocre rhythm guitar player and I have a kind of a shuffle guitar rhythm style I've always had um, and on this record I intentionally you know was doing more bar chords and more sort of fast downstroking stuff and while that creates a faster rhythm there it sort of implies a slower rhythm with the drums because uh, the tempo of the song just slows to fit in that fast guitar thing at least for what I was doing and so you know I had that I had kind of the classic Dum Dum Girls legato reverb you know bigger guitar leads which I tried to make even more dramatic I think on this record um, and I was just like there's there's room for some sort of sparkly stuff and let's talk about some of the notable material on the album so many songs have been applauded and one of the most applauded songs is the song Rimbaud Eyes. Whilst it's a nod to 19th century French poet Arthur Rimbaud, the actual story for the song, the origin of the song, comes from a t-shirt that your husband, <laughs> your husband branded Sort of, wore. yeah, sadly as a literature student, um, yeah, it's a little more superficial than that. No, um, definitely a favorite uh, writer of mine, uh, a big favorite in my home, um, in my circle of friends, and um, that was I suppose demonstrated by the fact crocodiles were on tour in Europe and had a few shows in Paris I mean in France and um, made such a stink about having a day off so they could go to the hometown of Rumbo and you know do the touristy things and Brandon went to a gift shop and bought this t-shirt and he literally never took it off it's been like two or three years and he's not wearing it tonight because I finally washed it today at the hotel because it was so disgusting. It like could walk around on its own. Um, but anyway, so I just got I just got used to seeing this like very piercing portrait all the time, um, and it sort of just became part. It took on like as though it it was a character itself. Um, and for me, you know, the eyes have always been a big thing. You know, it's one of the first things I notice. Um, second is hands. But, um, you know, I, I'm probably one of those silly, silly people who think you can kind of read a person or, or recognize that you can't read them based on what looking them in the eye is like. Uh, so I just kind of, you know, the, the little idea kind of grew in the back of my head. Um, and the phrase came to me you know, it's just, you know, like a thing you would say, like, when you saw somebody that had that sort of piercing glare, like, you could contextualize it like that. Um, so it was a little more lighthearted than, uh, you know, his poetry might uh, make you think the song was about. But I didn't know really what to do with the song. I was like, okay, that's such like a, you know, little pop phrase that doesn't really have, I have no idea what the direction behind you know that should be I'm not gonna write like a biographical song about him or what that means it's gonna that's a, so isolating like nobody knows what that is so instead I just went through a few of uh, my favorite pieces of, of his and found I just waited until I found something that kind of jumped out at me as appropriate that could be sort of uh, you know interpreted as, as some sort of love song um, and kind of adapted a couple of the stanzas. And the end result was absolutely stunning. Great Thank you. <laughs> the video that accompanies Rimbaud Eyes was um, done by your friend Tamarin. Yeah. And um, there's some great stylistic techniques adopted and you got, uh, your girls are exploring neon downtown. <laughs> yeah. I mean it's brilliant kind of animated. How, how pleased were you with the result that Tamarin had I was, up? yeah, I was really, really happy. I mean, I've worked with her pretty closely on this record. Um, she like creative directed sort of the whole thing and so has overseen to some degree the previous videos, you know, art directed the photo shoots and um, helped with, uh, you know, everything from the t-shirts to the album cover. So it was cool to have somebody that's so aesthetically minded. I mean, like, 
I consider myself aesthetically minded, but she, you know, has it down to a science. I've read that whilst you visit the UK and London in particular, you like to just walk around until you get lost and you like to also <laughs> visit museums. Um, have you found any raw vegan places that you're fond of? <laughs> um, I've been to a few, but they, I think I found them all accidentally. I went to one in Soho once when my manager still lived over there. It was like in between, you know, strip bars or whatever. Um, I went to one in Camden, like a really hippie. It's funny because, you know, they're oftentimes so new agey, um, which I, you know, I'm not saying I'm not, but... Um, in New York, they at least, uh, you know, put on some darker airs or something. <laughs> you can get some organic wine in like a candle lit basement restaurant with your fake cashew pesto. What about Madame Jojo's? I mean, we know you like Madame Jojo's. Have you visited Madame Jojo's? I have not been back since we played. I would love to go back. Uh, that was one of uh, one of that that initial trip when we first came over with the first single and we played four or five London shows, you know, it was one of those things where, yes, technically we're f much better now. You know, years later we have a million times the material and confidence in what we're doing, but there, you know, there's nothing like those first times. They stick in your, in your head. They're, they're such good memories, and that show in particular was a lot of fun, and... I probably remember it more than I remember most shows just because it was such a new experience. As you head forward in the music industry as an esteemed outfit, as an esteemed talent, what's the most important philosophy? What do you hope to stay true to? What's the most important dynamic you hope to maintain? Um, I mean, I think ultimately the, the longer you do it, the m more potential for what you're trying to do to be watered down becomes, you know, like there's so many more people who have opinions and have some sort of position in your situation and I think luckily because I am such a freak of nature and, you know, a hermit, it's very easy for me to shut that stuff out. So I'm not really too concerned with um, being influenced by any kind of expectation or demands or, you know, my label has never made any kind of creative suggestion, which I would be incredibly offended by. So I'm lucky because I know that's rare. Um, my manager is pretty hands off creatively as well. He's like, no, no, you do that thing. And then I do the other stuff. And so I, that's great. Um, I think it's just the, the getting jaded thing which is so sad to see, you know, like that's probably my, my biggest goal is to just maintain an appreciative perspective, you know, on the kind of life I get to lead right now.